So there's an unwritten rule in chemistry. And that rule is the number one thing you should always remember whenever you're leaving a laboratory. And that is to always wash your freaking hands. You know, unless you're trying to find an alternative for sugar, in which case, go nuts, my friend. In 1879, organic chemist Constantin Fulberg was playing around with coal tar derivatives in his laboratory at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Organic chemistry was still in the early stages of being a legitimate thing and not all hand-wavy alchemy. Hydrocarbons and aromatic compounds weren't really very well understood, but there was a substance kind of just literally lying around in the streets in the Industrial Revolution. It was called coal tar, and it was just chock full of these hydrocarbons and aromatic compounds, and so chemists were really, really excited about studying it. Excited about coal tar. It was a different time. Now, organic chemistry was only so very much newly just a thing that the number one unwritten rule in chemistry, always wash your freaking hands, was not actually widely enforced. Anyway, one day in 1879, Fulberg finished screwing around with his coal tar derivatives for the day and decided to go home. But as he walked out of the door, he didn't wash his hands. It's obviously the thing now that we have to wash our hands, but back then it wasn't a thing and it just wasn't done and always wash your hands. Oh, the undergrad chemistry tutor in me is just having a fit right now. Just wash, wash your hands, guys. Just do it. Just do it. Fulberg got home, ate a piece of bread, and stopped because his bread tasted sweet. It wasn't supposed to taste sweet. Fulberg was curious. What on earth was causing his bread to taste sweet? Was it something on his hands? Was it something that he'd been working with that day? He'd been handling a lot of coal tar, and so it must have been something in that. And so anyway, he went back and systematically isolated what exactly it was that was causing his hands to taste sweet, and managed to isolate the very first sugar alternative, saccharin. On a side note, I actually really don't want to know exactly how he systematically isolated isolated what was making his hands taste sweet. It was probably a case of like making something, looking at it in the beaker and taking a swig. Don't do that. That's also the second unwritten rule of chemistry. Don't drink the stuff that you make. Just don't eat it. Don't breathe it. Don't look at it. Just wash your hands. <laughs> Just <laughs> Ah, oh, this whole story is making me shudder. But that is not the only version of this story. The professor in charge of the laboratory that Fulberg worked in, Ira Remsen, maintained until his dying day that it was him who had that experience with the sweet hands, that it was him who isolated saccharin for the first time. Fulberg and Remsen actually published the paper together, but it's still really unclear who it was that actually did the work that actually isolated saccharin in the first place. The reason we attribute it to Fulberg, however, is because he was the one that went out and filed the patent. Fulberg recognised that saccharin was a big deal. Saccharin would be the way forward in the food additives industry. Unfortunately for him and his sense of pride, this sweeping declaration wasn't entirely wrong. You see, about 30 years after he filed for the patent, World War I happened. And what came with World War I? food rations. Sugar suddenly became this commodity, it became really expensive, and so saccharin kind of popped up in the corner and went, hey guys, hi, I can do the thing, I can make your food taste sweet for a fraction of the cost. Yay! But there were a handful of people who, when they found out exactly where saccharin was isolated from, kind of went, eh, I don't really want to eat coal tar derivatives. So Teddy Roosevelt, the president of the United States at the time, set up a committee, as you do. The committee was led by Ira Remsen and it was designed to figure out whether or not saccharin would be safe to consume. After a bunch of rigorous testing and going over data, they concluded that it was fine. And it continued to be a fairly popular alternative to sugar all the way through World War I and World War II. Saccharin kind of hovered in the background for a while after World War II as a sugar additive, until about the 1960s, 1970s when people suddenly started caring about the amount of calories that they were consuming on a daily basis. You see, saccharin has an advantage over cane sugar. It's zero calories. It's nothing. You consume it, it goes in one way, it comes out the same way, it's not metabolised by the body, it's zero calories. And so people suddenly started eating saccharin again as an alternative for sugar. Saccharin is completely safe for you to eat. Now it turns out that saccharin is not only fantastic for people who are counting calories, it's also great for people who can't eat sugar, people like diabetics. Saccharin is a really, really good alternative, but I would say if you're looking for a quick energy hit, sucrose is probably your best bet. Because saccharin will literally do nothing. Plus, sugar is pretty tasty. I do quite like it. It's probably not helping my tea, but, you know, 
it's it's pretty good. Hmm. But still, wash your hands, people. Just do it. Actually, on a side note, I remember I was demonstrating once. I was tutoring a, a chemistry laboratory. And um, I caught one of my students kind of with like a packet of twisties in his pocket. <laughs> and he was just like eating them while we were making esters. And we had a whole bunch of stuff going on in the steam cupboard. And he was just sitting there eating his twisties. No, don't do that. That's Darwin Award material. That's in... Oh. This whole episode just... <sighs> Wash your hands, guys. Wash your hands. That's all I have to say.